In week three, we are looking at the postpartum stage. Here is something I want you to remember. Women still die today from postpartum hemorrhage. We abbreviate it as PPH, and you are going to see it as a diagnosis uh, when you go to the postpartal unit. We will be studying it in more detail in the chapter on postpartum complications as well. If you think a lot of ink is being used in talking about postpartum hemorrhage, you're right. Every nurse who has taken care of a postpartum woman has been shocked to find a woman that seems perfectly healthy and fine, that has little blood on her perineal pad, but she's bled volumes that have overflowed onto the chucks underneath her and has pooled under her back where the unsuspecting nurse wasn't looking for it. We have felt a boggy or a squishy fundus in a woman who was contracting so nicely an hour ago. It takes vigilance to take care of these ladies, and your CNA is a good partner who will help you a lot if you use her wisely. Here is a fact. A firmly contracted uterus in the immediate postpartum is a wonderful thing. A soft, boggy is the word we use, uterus, is bleeding. If it's not hard and firm, it's bleeding probably bleeding like crazy. When I was learning to be a midwife, I was supposed to be taking care of an early postpartum lady. She didn't like her uterus being massaged because it hurts so much since it's sore from so much recent exertion. So I very gently massaged her fundus and though I didn't know it, I wasn't doing her any good. My instructor came in and felt the uterus through the abdominal wall. Dina, she said, look at this. I looked. She leaned, all 300 pounds of her, right onto the woman's uterus while the woman groaned and moaned in agony, and out onto the peri pad popped a clot the size of a softball. The woman had been bleeding the entire time. The blood had been collecting in the uterus and forming a clot large enough that the uterus couldn't contract well around it. To massage a uterus, you have to put your hand just over the symphysis pubis, pressing just anterior to it to prevent the uterus from inverting. Then with your left hand, you find the fundus, massaging it, pushing it with as much pressure as is necessary to make it contract, pushing it toward the symphysis pubis. Essentially, you have the uterus between your hands. Nowadays, we usually give Pitocin IM or IV after the placenta is out, and that keeps it fairly well contracted. It doesn't always work. And then we depend heavily on good old-fashioned uterine massage. We do have a secret weapon, however, that helps mom, baby, and the nurse, and that is breastfeeding. Breastfeeding, particularly the infant suckling stimulates the nipples, which causes a surge of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. This works wonders in keeping the uterus contracted, but the effect wears off when the baby stops. Sometimes the baby doesn't want to nurse. Maybe he's too sleepy. Sometimes the Pitocin we administer seems to have no effect. Then we can give Methergine, Hemabate, or Cytotec if mom's BP is not too high. It's too high, we cannot give those. Pitocin is the only one you can give in hypertension. But I have seen cases in which none of those worked. The only thing that kept the woman from bleeding out was bimanual pressure. A nurse with a long elbow length glove makes a fist and inserts it as far as possible into the giant vagina and with the other hand outside the abdomen held the fundus and the uterus firmly against the fist. Uterus is compressed in between. The problem at that time was a piece of retained placenta in the uterus that wouldn't allow it to contract well. After it was removed, the uterus contracted nicely and the bleeding stopped. Things, things can happen so quickly. Postpartum nurses, as I said, have a sixth sense when it comes to detecting bleeding. You will learn a lot from them. If you get a quiet nurse that doesn't volunteer much information, then you be sure to ask a lot of questions. We old timers have also seen women stand up for the first time to walk to the bathroom and immediately faint. So we take precautions. The first time any woman gets up, we make her sit on the side of the bed for a longer time than she may want to sit, 
just to make sure she doesn't have postural hypotension. And we may have two people accompany her to the bathroom the first time. That's always my rule for students. First time up, two people help the girl, even if that is the student nurse and the, the woman's husband or mother for the second person. Know the signs of potential complications. These are warning signs that a patient should not be discharged. On the postpartum unit, there is a lot of pressure on the nurses to get the patients assessed, taught everything they need to know to care for their babies, which can be a lot in a prima para, and discharged as soon as possible within the legal time frame. The signs of potential complications are red flags that all is not going well and the doctor will have to be involved in the decision as to whether the woman can go home. Both of you are legally responsible. What happens if you disagree? It can get complicated. This is worth a discussion in post-conference. Sometimes you may actually have to go over someone's head. Most of the time it isn't necessary since our litigious society has sufficiently scared all health care providers into being extremely cautious, but good documentation is essential in postpartum. I have heard nurses in critical care disparage the Homan sign and say it's not particularly effective in discovering a DVT or deep vein thrombosis. We use it as an assessment tool in postpartum, perhaps because we have nothing else that is free and is available without orders, and it's somewhat effective. You will need to use it on all your patients. The care paths are almost universal and they really do help keep everyone on the same page in postpartal care. Take a good look at them before you go to this clinical. Postpartum nurses wear many hats. Some hospitals have the nurses care for only mom while nursery nurses are responsible for babies. Many more have the same nurse care for both mom and baby, so postpartum nurses have to be comfortable with both adult and pediatric nursing. Sometimes postpartum nurses are pulled to the NICU in the lower levels because they can care for infants. We usually tell postpartum women to continue their prenatal vitamins for six weeks or until they stop breastfeeding. I used to have women ask me all the time about a medication to suppress lactation when they're not planning to breastfeed. There is nothing at all on the market for that at this time. There was something years ago uh, that has been taken off and nothing has emerged to take its place. It is true that estrogen suppresses lactation, but we don't give it as contraceptive early enough to help in the immediate postpartum. Later, if a woman is breastfed for several months and then starts oral contraceptives, she may find that they help her to dry up. If she's ready to stop breastfeeding, this is fine. If she wants to continue breastfeeding anyway, even on the estrogen, she may need to breast feed or pump more often to overstimulate milk production to offset the initial effect of the estrogen. Other estrogen containing contraceptives like the ring and the patch would have a similar effect. Review the indications for ROGAM administration. The isoimmunization problem was unsolved until the middle of the 20th century. Before that, RH negative women usually had one baby without difficulties. Sometimes a second one was born without being too emaciated. After that, the fetus typically died in utero for all the subsequent pregnancies. Now with RH immune globin, uh, RH negative women can have as many children as anyone else. We usually advise women not to resume sexual activity until six weeks postpartum. I have had women come for their six weeks visit, however, already pregnant. This means that to prevent unplanned pregnancy, women need to be aware of contraceptive options before ever leaving the hospital. I really like to bring it up on one of the last prenatal visits whenever I can. Some women will have Depo-Provera injections during the postpartum hospitalization, which keeps the mother for about 12 weeks before she has to think about it again. And the progesterone in the Depo-Provera does not inhibit milk production. For the same reason, the mini pill, which is progesterone without any estrogen, is appropriate. It's such a very small amount of hormone, though, that it has to be taken at the same time every day. Not an easy feat for a mom with an infant that is not yet sleeping through the night. Implanon, the progesterone implants that go in the arm, and IUDs are also appropriate 
in the first few weeks postpartum.